I mean, this is the first earliest I think that I've been at tech that it has snowed and it, it and, and and this wasn't the first day um, I had some visitors in my office last week on I think Wednesday and they said they saw snowflakes and I I I, I disputed it and went and then I had to take back my disputation because it was, it was clearly a few flecks of snow last week. And then, um, yeah, so John um, suggests to go to the campus webcams and you can see the fall colors on campus and looking at Mont Ripley. And yeah, so was it was the um, chairlift just open for one day or was it is it open all week? Do you know, Ishan? Uh, the, the chairlift? Yeah. I think it opened for weekends. Okay. As far as I know, it opened for three weekends for fall <laughs> colors. Good to know. Yeah. I did not know that. Um, so we are being live streamed. Welcome, everybody. Um, and that means on Facebook, people are joining us through that method. And I am going to start getting myself organized by closing even more windows. Um, I have so many <laughs> open, it's not funny. It's harder when I'm traveling because I just have my little, my small laptop to work, to work out of. But I'm going to get my um, slides shared, share screen. All right, so you're probably seeing a whole bunch of things, right? All right, so this is what I want to get big. Hang on. Oh, I have too many things open. Excuse my clumsiness. All right, so this I want to view the show. Start from the beginning. Good. All right, I'm ready now. Well, it's interesting because every time I leave town, I'm, I'm always just so struck by the beauty. Um, so I, I, in the flight this morning, as after we rose above the clouds, um, I, I was able to see the dawn rising and it was so stunning because it was rising above the clouds and it was just mm -hmm. really, really, really beautiful. I haven't been on a flight that early in the morning in a long time. Do you go to an annual meeting? Yeah, I I planning to do in November this year. Oh, the AICHE meeting. Yeah, yeah, that's a big one, I think, right? Yeah, that is a big one. Well, while you're there, make sure you um, talk to everybody who you think might want to apply to be chair of chemical engineering because we're, we're yeah having, we have that open search and we also have tenure track faculty positions. Right. Yeah. So yes, actively recruit for us. I'll do that. All right, and we are getting close to the hour. Um, so um, I did want to, um, uh, um, I wanted to, well, first of all, I wanna thank Leonard Bowman um, who took over last week's hosting. So thank you, Leonard. Uh, and I wanted to also ex say, I'm sorry that I wasn't there and I'm gonna show you a slide of what I was doing uh, in a moment, but um, uh, I think we're right about on the hour. So um, welcome everybody to Husky Bites. My name is Janet Callahan and my role at Michigan Technological University is that I am Dean of the College of Engineering and host of Husky Bites. And we are in season six of Husky Bites. Uh, and uh, we have a very exciting talk this evening. So welcome everybody. So this is where I was last week. I was in Pittsburgh and I was inducted as a fellow of the Society of the American Ceramic Society uh, in recognition of notable contributions to the ceramic arts and sciences. So that's where I was and it was a very lovely night. And my two, two of my sisters joined me uh, and it was really nice to just, just be there. And then um, my, uh, I was nominated by um, Rosario Gerhardt. Uh, she led the nomination package. And so I, I wanted to just also thank her. Uh, and so what is a fellow, some of you may say or may ask, um, uh, it, it's an honor that societies award uh, often in recognition of, of a combination of scientific accomplishments and engineering accomplishments plus service to the society. And in this case, I did a lot of service to the society as well as my, you know, my, my scholarly work in support of accreditation um, uh, uh, where I still work very hard. It's an organization called ABET and each society 
So AICHE, uh, Ishan, uh, also has an organization. They also have a um, committee where mm -hmm. if, you are, if you're ever interested, you can volunteer um, to become a program evaluator. And then what you do is you go out and visit other universities um, and it helps you learn um, how other universities run really good programs, but it also helps you, I think, um, grow as a leader. Uh, and so um, anyway, that's where I was in Pittsburgh. So uh, thanks again, Leonard. And um, thank you. So many Congratulations. Of you many people sent me an email <laughs> like that. So thank you, everybody. And um, thank you. And thank you, Ishan. All right. Next slide. And I have frozen for some reason. There we go. Our fall colors. Uh, so this is the view outside my office window, which is where I am not right now. And today, I think it has little dustings of white on it, right? Because we have a little bit of snow. Yep. Uh, this is our menu. We're about halfway through the season. Next week, um, we should be hearing about the Michigan Tech band experience. Uh, and uh, so we're working on lining up some students to speak with us about that as well. And remember, we wrap up um, the season with with um, our finale on the Monday of Thanksgiving week. Uh, and uh, so I just wanna let you know that that's our season. Uh, this is our next speaker. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and you can start sharing. Uh, each okay. and so it is my pleasure this evening to introduce chemical engineering faculty member Ishin Liu, uh, who uh, is a fellow um, University of Connecticut Husky, like me, uh, uh, and uh, following her graduation with her PhD from UConn, this is not in Alaska, this is University of Connecticut in stores. Uh, she then went on to work for industry and she's going to elaborate on this. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Thank you, Dean Callahan. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, so good evening, everyone. So today's talk, our topic is sensing smells. Um, so a little bit introduction about myself and Riley, um, my undergrad student. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I was born and raised in China and I came to United States in 2010, uh, study chemical engineering and I got a PhD from the University of Connecticut. So like Janet said, our Moscat is Husky as well. So I was a cup Husky and now I'm a Husky at Michigan Tech. Um, so my undergraduate research at that time was focusing on uh, novel nanomaterials for um, different sensing applications. So my PhD projects uh, that was to develop a high temperature gas sensor that could be placed near the combustion uh, area, which was uh, should withstand high temperature. Uh, so to help optimize the combustion process. And then on the side, I was working on the detection technology for uh, glucose blood and e explosive as well. So after I graduated in 2014, I joined ABB Corporate Research Center. I don't know how many of you have heard of ABB before. So it is a Swiss and Swedish company, many operating power, heavy electric equipment, robotics and automation. And you can see I'm showing the transformers and the robotic arms from ABB. So my main role there was to develop the chemical sensing te technology for power component health monitoring and uh, male function prediction. So one of the uh, main project was to develop a hydrogen sensor which could put in the transformer. And if there's any uh, male function about the transformer, usually hydrogen in the insulation oil is the first indicator that tell us something is wrong. So I stayed uh, at ABB for about five years and then uh, in 2020, I decided to move back to academia. Uh, and then th this is where I landed at Michigan Tech. So I started uh, our lab named the Smart Chemical and Biologic Sensing Laboratory. So the main focus is to develop biomimetic sensing technologies, which includes artificial affection, which is also called electronic nose, which are what we are going to talk about tonight. Um, and we're also working on artificial receptors, which is trying to mimic the functionality of antibodies. We will briefly touch on that as well today. Uh, and of course, the artificial intelligence that's gonna help us to analyze the sensor data and also guide our uh, material design. 
So I'll let Riley to introduce himself. Yeah, all right, thank you. So my name is Riley Smith. Um, I guess I'll kind of go a little bit about me. So starting on the left here, I am from Kalamazoo, Michigan. So for people who don't know, that's on the west side of the state, south of Grand Rapids. Um, I went to high school at Gull Lake. Uh, so go Blue Devils, if anyone's familiar. Um, and then I also ended up staying there one extra year. A program that they had um, offered in that area was staying as a high school student, air quotes, and going to community college. So I ended up staying on for my fifth year um, and getting my associate's degree. So I got my associates and then I ended up transferring to Michigan Tech. Uh, a little bit of a fun story with that. I never went to the UP or visited Michigan Tech before coming up here. I just kind of, I had heard good things. I knew they had a good program and I just went out there and I haven't looked back. Um, so some things that I do up at Michigan Tech, uh, KME SAB, so Chemical Engineering Student Advisory Board. Uh, I happen to be the president this year of that. So that's just an org where we talk with the faculty and try to make different improvements to make the student experience better. Um, along with the chemical engineering work that I do, I'm a peer mentor this year uh, for chemical engineering as well. So we're, we work with the academic advisor for the department and help uh, just kind of give advice to people who are coming into the degree and might not know exactly what they want to do. And then I've been working as an RA for, let's see, this will be my second semester as an RA. So I came in last year off of co-op uh, for the spring semester and then started this year. So thoroughly enjoyed that. I'm an RA in Wadsworth Hall this year, but last year I was in East McNair. And then in between, so kind of a circle here, because obviously I'm still at Michigan Tech, uh, but in that stint, I was at Appian uh, on my co-op. So that was paper coating. So we did thermal paper. Specifically, I worked on, well, the company did thermal paper and some other things. Specifically, I worked on thermal paper. So looking at, here's a, an image there. If you if you're not um, watching, listening, it's a zoomed in image of a piece of paper and you can kind of see the fibers on that. So that was kind of what I was looking at while I was working. Uh, and then thermal paper is like receipt paper. So if you've ever scratched it with your fingernail and you see it turned black, that's the chemistry that we put on the paper while I was working there. So yeah, that's it. Well, thank you, Riley. So um, right now you are seeing is a picture of an ABB2 arm robot. So I, while I was working at ABB, so our sensor group is right next to the robotics group. So I had many opportunities to work with them, brainstorm and collaborate with people in different areas. So um, we are putting a bunch of sensors on robots. So we put the force sensor so the robot can feel the force, tactile sensor so they can kind of uh, better manipulating. Uh, and we also put cameras, machine vision, on the robot so the robot can see, right? So we want to make a robot to be smart, just like humans. Um, they can feel, they can see, they can touch. And because I am a chemical sensor person and I was keep thinking like, what if I put a chemical sensor on robot, what it can do? So it's been in my head for a few years while I was working there. I asked myself, why not put a gas sensors Maybe the robot can smell. Well, is there an application to it? So now let's see a few of the dog uh, pictures. So the first one, dog at work, is sniffing out uh, survivors. And then the next one, the dog is searching for explosives. Uh, dog are, tra are uh, detecting the underground pipeline leakage. And also more recently, there are dogs being trained for cancer detection. So all of these applications or all of these dogs are because they have the superior uh, affection, right? They smell, they, they can smell a lot of things at a very low concentrations. So people are using an array of gas sensors to simulate dog's nose, which we call electronic nose that we are gonna talk about a little bit later. Um, so these dogs are very expensive to train and the number of them are very limited as well. So if we can successfully develop an electronic nose that can do dog's job, we can imagine that the electronic nose could guide a robot, a mobile robot that can 
a search for survivors can detect explosive, especially for those areas which uh, where it's dangerous and difficult to access for human or dogs. So what exactly is the electronic nose? So if we look at our biologic nose, so we have our odor receptors to recognize different odorants and olfactory bulb process uh, that process the data. Um, and then that all the information passed through our brain so we can make a decision whether uh, in front of us it's a coffee or it's a tea, right? Similarly, for an electronic nose, we are trying to mimic the functionality of our biologic system. So we're having array of gas sensors as receptors collect the data and transfer it to a well-trained machine learning algorithm, just like our brain. Then the algorithm can make the decision and tell us the results. So there are there are a couple aspects that's very important to the performance of biological nodes and the same as the electronic nodes. So the first one is how many olfactory receptors we could have. We all know that dogs' nodes outperform humans' nodes by far a lot. So we are having, we have about six million olfactory receptors. So how many do you think dog has? More. <laughs> More, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so humans have how many? Oh, six million. Six million, yes. All right. Yeah, I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with 300 million like everybody else is here. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It's either that... B or C, right? We, we know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. So we have a bunch of people filling out the polls and yeah. um, and the majority answer at about, about 60% about, is, yeah. is C. That is actually correct. <laughs> <laughs> so... Dogs has 300 million. It's about 50 times more than we do. Um, so this is one of the important aspects that dogs has more olfactory receptors uh, than us. Uh, another important aspect is how sensitive this, this olfactory receptors are, could be, right, to sense the, the order. So before we actually discuss any numbers, I'd like to show you how small amount uh, parts per million is because the parts per million or ppm is is the most often used concentration for for gases. So if we are looking at this whole cube, that if this is one, then we divide it to a million parts of this cube. So this tiny little bit dot here that is one ppm. Um, it's one parts per uh, per million. So. Just to give you a sense like what's concentration usually for gas that's, that's around us. So carbon monoxide sensors or alarm, we every house has one. Um, so just take a guess, like what level does a carbon monoxide alarm go off? And I want to say, if you don't have a carbon monoxide detector, you should get one and install it because it's a very helpful thing to have. Um, I lived across the street from neighbors once in Atlanta when I worked at Georgia Tech and their whole family was nearly killed because their furnace wasn't venting properly. All right, so we can see the answers are pouring in and this time they think the answer is B. Yes, our audience are great. <laughs> it is B, about 50 ppm. So I'm also showing a chart of oxygen, different oxygen level. And so essentially an oxygen monoxide alarm should go off within a few hours if we are exposed to 50 ppm. So it's still considered low concentration carbon monoxide. So uh, it says here the maximum safe level for long-term exposure that is 50 ppm. If we go beyond on that, so for for example, for 150 ppm, the the carbon monoxide alarm should go off within minutes. Okay, so we should feel dizziness, headache within two hours, sort of. And if it gets to really high, um, then it's very dangerous. So basically, the top the carbon monoxide is a 
toxic gas, but at the same time, it is odorless, so we cannot sense it. So for something we can sense, right, ammonia has a strong smell, just like a sweat or urine. It has a very sharp odor. So most people can smell ammonia somewhere around 5 ppm. And dog's nose can be 10,000 times more sensitive than ours. So which means they can detect the odor at PPT level. PPT, that's parts per trillion. So I'm trying to show how small amount that is, that one parts per trillion is equivalent to a single drop of water in 20 Olympic sized swimming pool. So that's how small amount of that. So dog's nose are very sensitive. So they got more auto receptors. They are more sensitive than ours. And the last aspect is the part of dog's brain that is devoted to analyzing smells is about 40 times larger than ours. So they got, they got higher computational power than ours as well. So how do these aspects actually reflect on our electronic nose? So we were in the single selective sensor for a long time. And now we are gradually shifting to a large amount of a sensor array, which can detect more complex environment. So ideally, the electronic nose should have more numbers of sensors. That means we have more kinds of olfactory uh, receptors and each receptor should be very sensitive. They, they can detect the low concentration of gases. And also uh, we should have the higher computation power to support that data analysis. Now with the rapid development of machine learning and artificial intelligence, the computational power is really not a problem. So our bottleneck it's still how to make those sensors to be sensitive and the sensors to be different enough to approach to probe different gases. So the electronic nodes can have many applications like food qualities or more complex environment, uh, smart farming and the breast analysis, which we could use for medical diagnosis. Just take the breast analysis as an example. So our human exhaled breath is rich in uh, physiology information. So the, the breast analysis is highly attractive in early detection and prediction for slowly progressing diseases such as diabetes and cancers. So it provides a non-invasive way for disease diagnosis. So I have some selected breast analysis biomarker listed here. So for some diseases like asthma, diabetes, they, they only have one single biomarker. And you see their normal concentration is somewhere sub ppm parts per million level. And some of them are in the parts per, per billion level. So we really need high sensitive sensors to be able to sense that. And for some, uh, diseases like lung cancer, or even more recently study, there are electronic no, studies for COVID-19. So there are a list of um, biomarkers that's volatile organic compounds. There are 20, about 20 to 35 of them. And the concentration can all be down to the PPB level. So for those type of diseases, instead of a single selective sensor, then we really need to have a pattern recognition that the sensor array could sense different gases differently. So we could recognize the pattern and differentiate whether this is a breath from a healthy people or it's from unhealthy patients. So what are the sensors we are actually using? So today I'm gonna introduce the one of the most traditional sensors that's made oxide semiconductor gas sensors. So these are introduced, first introduced in 1950s. So they've been out there for 70 years. Uh, those are the off the shelf sensors on the market, um, carbon monoxide sensors, nitric oxide sensors. We got VOC sensors as well. So most of them are made with the metal oxide. So metal oxide, they are insulator 
um, at room temperature, but when you heat it up, so you usually operate at 200 to 500 Celsius. So they become their charge carrier, whether it's electrons or holes, they're gonna be movable, right? So they become a semiconductor. So inside of this housing, so usually there are two typical sensor designs. So either it's gonna be based on a ceramic tube and inside of the tube, we have the heater. And then outside of the tube, we have two electrodes and between them, it's a sensing film. Usually it's a metal oxide film. And then more recently um, shifted to a, to a inter digital electrodes where the electrodes has those fingers and it's still a two electrode system but this way in this way the two fingers actually have small spacing so the material could better in contact with the electrodes and the heater is on the bottom of this um, the substrate plate so these are the two typical uh, sensor design for semiconductors so just to talk a little bit about the sensing mechanism so the metal oxide sensors, they are out there for 70 years, like I said, right? And people have looked at most of majority of the metal oxide. So uh, about night, uh, I would say about 88% um, of the metal oxide are N-type, which means their, their charge carriers are electrons. And about 12% of the metal oxides are P-type. Uh, their carriers are the, the holes. So the sensing mechanism of semiconducting metal oxides are based on their resistance change in different environment. So for example, if we are having an N-type semiconductor, so in air, we would have those oxygen species that's absorbed on the, surf on the surface of oxide, which gonna extract electrons to the oxygen species and form a electron depletion layer at the surface of the metal oxide. So those electrons that's absorbed or that's taken by the oxygen species are not are not movable. In that way, uh, the res the uh, semiconductor in air usually have a high resistance. When it exposed to reducing gas, such as carbon monoxide, I'm showing here, the carbon monoxide that's going to take away of the oxygen, absorbed oxygen species and to form carbon dioxide. So after taking away of those oxygen species, the electron actually got released back to the semiconductor, which increase the conductivity or reduce uh, the resistance. So based on the resistance change, we could pretty much calibrate the sensor and to detect different gas concentrations. And the same rules applies for the P-type material, but they do response in a different direction. So up to now, you may think, right, from this sensing mechanism, you may think it seems metal oxide are not particularly for a certain gas. It seems like anything could interact with those oxygen species that would uh, lead to a gas sensor response. And you're absolutely right. So one of the drawback for a long time for the metal oxide gas sensors is the high cross sensitivity, that meaning they are not very specific to a targeted gas. Um, so of course, different metal oxide will have different catalytic activities and affinities to different gases, but almost it's impossible for a single sensor to just detect one gas. They always have some kind of cross sensitivity. And another drawback is the high working temperature. So that's often associated with higher power consumption compared to some sensors could work at room temperature. And it also introduced increased the signal drift. Um, so the, our next poll question. So after 70 years since the resistive metal oxide sensors being out there, uh, it's still the dominant gas sensors in the market. What do you think is the main reason for that? And so we've got four choices. A, they have higher sensitivity compared with other sensing technologies. B, their manufacturing costs are low and the alumni are overwhelmingly voting for this one. C, they respond faster than other types of sensors. And D, they have a longer lifetime than other types of sensors. You're getting an overwhelming B. Response. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Our, our audience are great. <laughs> 
So actually, they are they are all advantages of metal oxides. So metal oxides gas sensors they have high sensitivity. They they have fast response. Then also they have long rest, response. I mean the the long lifetime, but not necessarily better than others. So the the important the most important factor is the simplicity of the sensor and the low manufacturing cost. So it's still in the market and it's just still dominant, um, I would say in the research field as well. So with the concept and design of the electronic nails, the drawback, which is the low cross or the high cross sensitivity or low specificity is actually turning to new opportunities for electronic nails. So if we look at our biologic system again, right? So we have different odorant receptors. We have different odorants. And as you can see here, that each odorant receptors interact with a variety of odorants. None of them are really selective. And at the same time, each odorant can be recognized by different receptors as well. So this is exactly the same the same scenario for uh, elect for metal oxides. So the metal oxides can show response to several sensors. And if we manipulate uh, metal oxides composition and they can have different sensing profile, which show just have the same functionality of the odorant receptors. So we could leverage the diversity of metal oxide to create our electronic nodes and uh, another important aspect is we wanted to enhance the sensitivity of the metal oxide so it could uh, probe lower concentration odorants. So to do that, the research strategy we use in our lab, the first one is to explore new metal oxide and compo or compositions to increase the diversity of the sensing elements. Um, so a single component of metal oxide we talked about that has been widely investigated and our focus is put on more put on the martinary metal oxide. So for example, I'm showing the structure here. This is called a perovskite structure, which combines two metals or more metal ions in a regular lattice structure. So instead of a mixture, this is not a mixture. This is a single component, uh, single compounds, but it can combine um, two to four metal ions in this in the, this compound, and you usually show very unique catalytic activities, and can show different gas sensing profile as well. So we could also use the heterostructures that combine n-type and p-type material together. So our goal is really to establish a sensing material library with their sensing profile. So later on, if we have a specific application we want to work with, we could pick up those sensing elements as our one of the receptors in our um, electronic nails. And of course, to enhance the sensitivity, nanomaterials has been around for decades. And the, the major benefits or major advantage of using nanomaterial is their high specific uh, area. Meaning if we have a thin film of nanomaterials depo deposited compared with uh, the traditional technology of thin film, metal oxides, the nanomaterial will have way more surface area compared to the thin film. That way it would enhance the, the how much amount gas that could interact with the material to enhance the sensitivity. So in our lab particularly, we work on electrical spinning. So we dissolve the metal salts in a certain solvent and put a solimer and we mix the metal salts polymer uh, with the solvent together to, for, to form a polymeric um, precursory solution. Then we load in the syringe and it's connected with a metallic little uh, needle and we apply a very high voltage, usually 20 to 30 kilovolts high voltage between this needle and a metallic conductive connector. So that high voltage will drive the polymer solution and eject uh, nanofibers. So we get those um, polymer uh, nanofibers. So Riley is actually in our lab and he's gonna show us the electro spinning process from my, uh, our lab. We get, to do, a, we get to do a field trip. 
Yeah, let me switch between um, my computer and phone. So bear with me for a minute. All right, and so to see this, um, what you probably are gonna want to do is to click on the icon that says Riley Smith. And then on the little, the little dots there, I, I think you can pin it, pin Riley, pin Riley Smith. Um, do I need to stop sharing the slides? Why don't you try to stop sharing that? Yeah, yeah, let me do that. All right, good, that's working. All right, let's see. And then, if you, like I said, you might need to pin Riley Smith. So if you are seeing this, you're seeing a stripe on the floor right now. Will you guys let me know when I'm ready? We're we're ready. We're we watching. are ready. All right. Okay. Perfect. I was just I was waiting for the building up the anticipation, of course. So <laughs> here we have our machine um, in the lab. So it's currently running, and I'll kind of do a little quick uh, the image that we were just looking at. I always think that it's upside down, but that's the easier way to look at it. So here you can see we've got the syringe filled with our solution, um, and it's slowly pushing. Let's see if I can get it to point right. Right there, it's slowly plunging down that syringe. It's going through this tube and then it's coming out of that needle and then getting collected up. And you can see where it's been running for a little bit. So all of that on um, this foil here is uh, our nanofibers that we've already collected for today. So, and then let's see if you can, if I zoom in a little bit at the tip of that needle, I don't know if you can see it great, but that's right there where you can see it coming out um, and getting pulled towards the top. Cool. What um, what are your metal ions for this one? No, this, this one is just for it, yeah. it's just demonstration only polymers. Like, <laughs> yeah, this one's just polymers. So very cool. But, yeah, and it's a sealed unit, so it's it's yes. So yeah, it is a sealed, a sealed unit. unit. So I am wearing my lab coat, glasses, um, and gloves right now, just just in case, but. Uh, it is and, a sealed unit, and then we've got the safety light running. So that means that we do have the voltage running right now. So. Right. And there's an internal fan that's connected to the, to the ventilation system to the building. Mm -hmm. So it's actively ventilating uh, outside. So that's right. that pipe coming out. I guess you can kind of see it out, coming out yep. from the top back. Yeah. Yep. Very yeah. cool. It's nice to see what these startup funds are being used for. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Riley. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So, so let me bring back the slide. So what you just saw, that was the polymeric uh, nanofibers we collected on the foil. So after that, we put into a furnace and to burn off all the polymers, right? So we initially have the polymer that's the necessary for generating the nanofibers and then we burn off all the polymers it's kind of like a sacrifice template and now what you see here in this larger SEM image that is the metal oxides so all the metal ions turn to the metal oxides and then we deposit those metal oxides nanofibers on the electrodes to bridge the to bridge the interdigital electrodes and and measure uh, evaluating the sensing performance towards different uh, gases. And Riley particularly, he's working on uh, a more advanced electrospinning. I will let Riley introduce this one. Yeah, so the project that I've been working on uh, is the core shell project. So we looked at a diagram where we're seeing one um, component being spun through a single needle. Uh, what I'm working on specifically is we're using, it's a different type of nozzle. So here you can see in this diagram, We've got a core fluid, so that's going to be the one that ends up being, um, so it's core shell project, so that'll be the core. Then we have the shell fluid, so that's going to be the outside. Uh, and this, so we talked a little bit about P and N type um, sensors. So this is, the goal is to create a more sensitive sensor, so you're combining both of those. You have the P N type composite, and that's hopefully making a more sensitive sensor. That's what you would expect to see. Yeah, so this project, it's, it's doing progress. And this is one of the 
um, from the um, TM, that's the uh, microscope. So from here we can see, so Riley used the, the cobalt zinc oxide, I think cobalt that was the, that was the core. So we didn't get, for this batch, we didn't get the perfect core shell structure, but as you can see here that those the elemental distribution that we got the zinc, the zinc, it's pretty much on the outside and they tend to uh, aggregate to those more uh, small nanoparticles. So one of the, one of the key uh, reason that we want to use a PN type uh, to generate the PN heterojunction is that if we only have a single material, their conduction band or their, their depletion layer, it's something like this, right? It's straightforward. But once we have the um, PN heterojunction, it's modulating the conduction channels of the material. So that's going to exaggerate the change when we expose to different gases. So we are still optimizing this cold shell spinning process. Hopefully we could ge um, generate a more uniform cold shell structure. Um, and yeah, so we haven't tested this material yet, but this is very, uh, I mean, this is a very efficient way to create a hetero structure uh, nano, nano material. So the, the last bit I wanted to talk about uh, is the molecular imprinting polymer technology. So as we talked about the metal oxide based on their sensing mechanism, it's there's no specificity, which is also what we want for majority uh, for the electronic nodes, I mean, for majority of the gases. But there are going to be some of the uh, compounds which could not be approached or could not be sensed by metal oxides. For example, some of those longer chain um, organic compounds, uh, they have higher molecule, molecule, uh, molecular weight. They could be uh, very difficult to sense or to pick up by metal oxides. So we have this molecular imprinted technology uh, that is to that mainly actually is for to creating biosensors in our lab for um, proteins, but it could be very sensitive uh, for those uh, volatile organic compounds as well. So briefly, we can have a template molecule, which is just the analyte we want to sense, right? So we put it with the functional monomers, and they're gonna do they're gonna do self assembly when we incubate them together. Their functional groups will attach it on the on the template molecule, which is the analyte. So then we do polymerization. They form a, uh, the polymer gonna form a polymer matrix around the template. And then we remove the template by chemical wash. And that way we can generate the cavity, which has the same shape as the molecule and also have the preferable um, functional groups. So this way, this imprinted polymer could have the selective interaction with the template molecule, which is also our analyte. So, um, so this material is to provide additional uh, recognition. If, for example, for breast analysis, there are some biomarkers which, if we could just not pick up. So this would be a way to create a sensor just for that biomarkers. So there are some preliminary data that shows if we imprint the sensor or the polymer with just the acetone, it shows the highest sensitivity compared to other uh, volatile organic compounds. And benzene, methanol, uh, formaldehyde as well. For with imprinted polymer, they could show higher or sele very selective detection to those organic compounds. So this kind of add an extra layer or extra variety to our uh, electronic nodes. So just to summarize, so we are working on to build the high performance electronic noses where sensing materials or sensing elements are still the bottleneck. So we are trying to use different uh, strategies to create a variety of sensing material which could probe uh, different gas differently that we can put together and use machine learning algorithms at the end um, to, to recognize the pattern we want. So the electronic nose definitely has a, a wide range of applications. Although there are certain, certainly there are, are a lot of challenges, but that's what we're working for. So 
at the end, I like to take the opportunity to thank my students. So we got Ben, Rylis here, me, Oscar, and Grace, and I have two other students that are not on the picture, uh, Rourke and, and Sarah. Um, very excellent students from Michigan Tech and also thank the startup funding from, from the university and also the SF grant. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Very good. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. And so um, audience, um, you can ask questions using the Q&A feature. And, uh, um, and so Riley and, and Ishin, you can feel free to, to pick up any of these questions. Jim remarked that he's also couldn't get out this afternoon. And if anybody's wondering where I am, I'm in um, Houston, Texas, where I'm here for, um, we're gonna be having an alumni social event and I'm also meeting with some alumni and visiting a high school. Uh, so, um, and so Riley, do you know the answer to this question? Can you still take skiing as a gym class? Yes, you can. You can still take skiing as a gym class. So I think they've got it, um, they, both, they have a bunch of different types of skiing. You can do the downhill, or you can do the cross country like those are both gym classes. All right, and do you see any technical questions you'd like to start answering? I saw this one. Are these electronic noses susceptible for a factory fatigue? Um, so I would say that's, that's a problem, not necessarily for electronic uh, noses. So all sensors gonna have some kind of drift, but that's gonna be over a few years. So it won't like biological knows that if you keep smelling or if you're sitting in the same environment for a long time, you kind of lost that smell or lost that ability to, to sense that smell. And that that's not the case for electronic uh, noses or gas sensors. So, but all the gas sensors, they do have sort of the signal drifting or lifetime issues. It's usually about a few years. Very good. And uh, Larry just compliments uh, this very interesting, well put together presentation. Awesome. Well, thank you, Larry. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, other so so Scott points out that dogs have been helpful in bed bug detection. They say. <laughs> Maybe I should have one here in my hotel room to see if there are bed bugs. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, um, I th the next question was the system viewed by the university. Uh, is it available commercially? I think there are some available electronic nodes, but they are based on a few or less than 10 sensors. Um, and for very specific applications. And what about your electro spinning system? Was that a commercial? Oh, that, that, that is a commercial product, yes. Okay, very good. Um, lots of questions about, all right, so here's a good question. So, so um, Stephen asks, what are the uses of the electro spun um, nanofibers? And so, um, so in our lab, we are creating the sensing materials. So it's our way to create our nanomaterials for gas sensing and electro spinning definitely for it, especially for the polymer film. There has a lot of applications like filtration, like mask with COVID-19. There are a lot of electro spawn masks as well. Um, so a question for both of you and, and maybe Riley, well, both of you actually, but nice to hear your answers on this. So what is a good major if you wanted to specialize in this area of research? Um, and of course, chemical engineering would be a good major, yeah. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, I would say a lot of faculties, they actually do interdisciplinary research. So chemical engineering, material science, I think that those would be my two top pick. How about you, Riley? <laughs> yeah, I think I would agree. We've got a lot of faculty here that do a lot of interdisciplinary research, um, but they all seem to start in chemical engineering and then branch out from there. Yeah, it's a very, chemical engineering is a very versatile um, discipline and our faculties has a, a wide range of interest. Well, and I was really proud that you showed a crystal structure 
because um, that that's speaking my language. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're from you're from uh, from material science, right? I started in chemical engineering, and so I have okay. a strong chemistry background. And then I my PhD is in material science. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, so Case K would like to suggest that the presenters submit an abstract to the annual Air and Waste Management Association conference and exhibition for 2023. Um, they see a lot of interest from the environmental community as nuisance odors are a big issue and finding a way to address this from an objective um, and, and subjective method is desired. Contact me if you need more information about, about that organization. Oh, awesome. Hey, um, so um, why don't you put your email up? up uh, yeah. Or maybe Sue, Sue, could you put um, uh, Ishan's email up? Um, that might be a good way for Kay to, to reach out to her. Yeah, no, I'm very excited about this research. So he, here, here's a question. Well, why don't you, do you see a question you want, Riley? Uh, I'm scrolling through them. I haven't seen, I don't see one right now. So go ahead if you see something. Well, Daryl's just commenting um, that in 1966, he took advanced skiing from Fred Lonsdorf, the ski team coach and 10th Mountain Division World War II veteran. That's pretty cool. 1966, I was, I was very young then. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl, <laughs> um, a lot of compliments. Uh, great, uh, great talk. Um, uh, have you done any work on sensing TCP? And I don't know what TCP is. Do you? TCP? No, not particular. Um, You'll have to explain what that is, Daniel. Um, uh, Dr. Liu, do you imagine cancer patients someday using such an electronic nose device to see if their cancer remains in remission? Well, it's the, the lung cancer, uh, electronic diagnosis for lung cancer has been, I think, the most active research area for electronic nose. Um, I definitely see in the future we could use electronic nose as a diagnostic tool. But that also depends on how sensitive it would be to be able to differentiate a healthy patient versus the cancer patient, healthy people with the cancer patient. And if the, so I think now most research are trying to differentiate this and less research has been done to really monitor how cancer patient has been progressed, like whether it's cured or still can, still got cancer, I think that's a, that's a future uh, topic. All right, and so this, this TCP was tricresyl phosphate, which I'm not very familiar with myself. Uh, and um, uh, Ishan, if you, if anybody would like to contact Ishan for follow-up, um, just, just, just look up her name, um, which is spelled Y-I-X-I-N, L I U uh, and uh, um, all right. So Pujitha says, can you touch a little on the machine learning algorithms you've used for any particular application or study? Yeah, so we use, we basically use a bunch of machine learning algorithms. Um, so the, the most, I would say the standard or out of the box machine learning algorithms that would be the support vector machine and decision trees those so we try different uh, algorithms and we also have collaborators that actually do the algorithm or construct different neural network layers for us so we recently got a paper that's not particularly for um, electronic nodes like um, data analysis that actually guiding us to synthesize our material and we use the Gaussian process. Um, and the cool part about that is oftentimes our experiments are subject to uncertainties and the Gaussian process algorithm could account for those uncertainties and the output not, not only give you the answer but also give you the probability that how likely it's gonna fall in that range. So we, we do, um, have a variety of algorithms for, for the projects. Oh, that's really cool. Well, all right, and now I feel really stupid because TCB is the oil from cannabis. Uh, and so you can tell you can tell how familiar I am with, with this particular substance. <laughs> so has it been used? Uh, are there any applications for sensing TCB, the oil from cannabis? I, I, uh, I don't know. 
I don't know, not I'm aware of. Um, yeah. Yeah, not not I'm aware of at least not for metal oxide. So I think if there's a spe specific compounds that we know uh, that's came from the ca uh, cannabis, and we definitely could create those uh, imprinted polymers for that detection. <laughs> but for metal oxides, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Um, how does the sense that when you have a mixture of more than two gases, how do these devices stand up? Um, well, that's why that's why we need a bunch of sensors, right? Because none of them are selective. So you actually have accumulated. They are not linear addition as well. So they would have uh, accumulated response for a single sensor. So it's impossible for a single sensor to really differentiate any of this gas that has a has a cross sensitivity. But once you have more sensors in that array, the other sensors could help you to differentiate because some gases, some sensors would pick only one gas, not the other. So that way you have a cross reference like this is picking this two up and mm -hmm. we can use algorithms to determine either their concentration or just like a pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. So Riley, tell us a little bit about what you're you're focusing on. Yeah, so um, you're talking about in, in, in the specifically in the lab or in my college career. Well, either one, but but in the lab for sure. Okay. So in the lab specifically, the focus that I've had um, from starting. So when I started, we were we were getting this nano spinning machine. Um, so we had that shipped in, and then we were actually in a different room. So we've gone through quite a few changes. We've added a lot of people to the lab and the projects have just continued to add on. Uh, but like I said, with the specifically this core shell is the project that I'm working on. So uh, we talked a little bit, but not in depth. So there's different things that you can do to make um, the material more sensitive as you're spinning it. So you can, you can change the height that the needle is actually coming out at. You can change the voltage that the machine is running at. And based on those parameters that you set the machine to run at, you're going to create slightly different morphologies. And those morphologies are gonna interact with the gas in the air in different ways. So the goal is to find the perfect blend of parameters to run the machine at, and then you'll have a, a to create a highly sensitive um, uh, material. Well, and, and I just wanna comment, I think um, one of the things I'm working hard to um, gather some money together to buy is a nice new state-of-the-art scanning electron microscope um, that we could use, we could definitely use here. We have some vintage instruments here that are approaching 20 years of age. And uh, um, so that's on my list, you guys. And if anybody wants to help with that, let me know. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big ticket item, about one and a half million. Um, so, oh, wow. hey, so Riley, what do you plan to do after you graduate? So the plan had been to go to med school, actually. My minor is uh, professional health um, or pre-profession, pre-health professions is the minor that we have here. And that just kind of groups all of the pre-med students or pre-professional health students together. So that was the goal for the longest time. And now I'm starting to open my eyes a little more into the possibility of dipping into industry for a year or two. Um, mm -hmm. I still think med school is on the table, but I think using my degree a little bit before jumping into more school, uh, sounds appealing right now. Now watch out, once you get your first mortgage, you'll never go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> well, and just a, a bunch of lovely comments here. Um, you know, like Stephen comments that chemical engineering is very closely related to metallurgical engineering and material science and engineering. And, and I agree. And it's like, that's what I loved about chemical engineering was the um, structural part of it when we started, you know, thinking about, you know, sensors and things like that. I think it's fascinating. Does anybody know if dogs can sniff out heart disease? I don't know. I'm not sure. I, don't know um, I, I just know they are trained to detect lung cancer. That's pretty active research right now. Yeah. Um, Lots of comments here, you know, and I hope I know you're looking through them, and I don't know 
um, I don't know what we know the answer to or not, but <laughs> John was an RA in Wadsworth back in 1966. Hey, so John, um, I married my RA. <laughs> He's the father of my children, just as an FYI. I, yeah, no. Um, so the reason that, um, that the electro spinning device is sealed is for safety. Am, um, or, is it, or is it just to kind of make sure that the, the purity of the sample is kept good? You, you want to comment on that a little bit, um, Ishin? Yeah, it's mainly for safety. I used to, when I was in graduate school, I used to work a self-build electro spinning and that was sitting in the film hood with no ink, ink exclusure. So it's pretty much for safety reason because of the high voltage. So it's about 20 kilovolt. So you definitely don't want to touch it while it's running. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And what um, Peg asks, what industries or companies have been most interested in your work or would mm, be interested? I, I think those, um, environmental monitoring those devices. So there's a lot of um, sensing device companies. Um, so we could either develop sensors for them or mm -hmm. if they are looking more integrated system for medical diagnosis or other applications, we can be very application uh, specific because different applications would have the different gas sensing profile needed, right? We could customize or build those customized electronic nodes for them as well. Well, and we're heading on up the hour. I wanna, um, I'm gonna thank the audience first and then I'm gonna, um, uh, Riley, if you have any comments you'd like to say in closing and then and then finally uh, you, Dr. Liu, but um, Husky Bites audience, um, I'm, I'm reading all these, all these, there's so many compliments about this talk. It was just a really high quality talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Liu. Thank you, audience. Um, I promise I'll be back in town next week and I'll show you uh, an updated version of the fall colors. Uh, and so with that, I, I wanna just thank everybody for joining us again for Husky Bites. And um, Riley, do you have some last remarks to make? Yeah, well, I, I just really wanna thank the audience for coming out. It's really an honor and a pleasure to show some of the research that we're still doing here at Michigan Tech. I know a lot of the audience is alumni. So looking back in and seeing that there's still great research going on, it's just, uh, it's, so it's such a pleasure to be a part of sharing that. Well, and, and yeah. we all think you should get a PhD with Dr. Liu. <laughs> uh, well, he, he told me at the very beginning, like he wanted to get the, go to the med school. So I know he's not doing it. <laughs> you can do both. You can do both. Oh, boy. <laughs> all right. Closing remarks. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, our, our audience. You're great. I mean, got the right answers for all the poll questions. <laughs> and for, for future students or future students' parents, I would highly promoting the chemical engineering as the, as the major. It's a very... Uh, versatile major, and not only uh, for more traditional uh, chemical engineering, like 50 years ago, right now, we are doing a lot of variety things in bioprocessing, in nanomaterials, like sensing technology. So there's a lot of opportunities for chemical engineering. I agree. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, and uh, enjoy the nice, cool weather we're getting. It, and I, I hear it's going to warm up again for the weekend. So yeah, should... it's good. It's getting warm up. But this morning it was a good cold, thirty degrees, and uh, it was borderline snowstorm. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Good night. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>